How we are linked to the work we do is deeply personal. I was born and raised in St. Paul, and I spent the majority of my life growing up in Minnesota, being one of the only students of color in my classes, the only Chicana for sure. In my teaching, in my scholarship, and through my creative work, I investigate how Chicanas, Latinx, subvert systemic inequalities by creating alternative narratives and spaces. Thinking about networks and relationships as constellations, myself and the other artists of color I collaborate with are trying to create work that fosters a sense of belonging and deep connection that extends beyond the production of the art itself. Work that ignites the imaginations of our community and inspires an alternative to the isolation many of us have felt. My goal is to tell stories and work with others to tell their stories so that another little girl who is growing up now doesn't have to feel like she's the only one in her class. My research broadly defined is interested in how Black, Indigenous, people of color, Latinx people create alternative spaces for healing in a really broad setting. So I might look at art production, performance, hip hop, poetry, for example. And then I might look at alternative economies, for example, how people are using different types of cooperatives to create an economy for themselves that's sustaining. Um, but I really think ultimately what I'm investigating is how do people take their radical imaginations and think through different areas of their everyday life to try to make it better for themselves. I think ultimately I come from many different schools of thought. I'm a Chicana feminist interdisciplinary scholar and I'm in an ethnic studies program in Chicano Latino studies department. At the heart of what we do um, in our interdisciplinary work is really thinking through in partnership with community, how do we make our world better, ultimately? Um, Chicana feminist Gloria Anzaldúa says, you know, we need to do work that matters. And so when I was a grad student and then now um, very early assistant professor, thinking through a lot of what does it mean for me to do work that matters? What does that look like? And what I kept coming back to as an artist and as a scholar is that I'm really interested in how do we think about space in a different way. And so to do that, we need our imaginations. Um, I think that there's so many studies out there that show at a very young age, children are told that they're not good at being creative, that they're not good artists. And then that just shuts down their imagination. And so I think about if I can cultivate imaginations for my students, how will that make them better in the professions that they want to get into? And in terms of radicalism, the traditions I come from, whether we're looking at critical race theory, Chicana feminism, black feminism, we take the idea seriously about radical ideas that push against systems um, of oppression. And so when we pair those together, having a type of radical consciousness with this idea of imagination, I think it really opens itself up to think about how we can build different spaces for ourselves to exist. I'm such an ethnic studies. I'm like, we don't discover anything. It's colonial. You know, for, for me, I think um, deciding to get a PhD in Chicano Chicano studies was deeply personal and deeply political. So I applied to other PhD programs in literature, communications, but at the time, UC Santa Barbara had the only Chicana Chicano st studies PhD program in the nation. And I knew that going into graduate school, going into the profession, which is academia, is so much not just a job, it's really heart work, right? It's your vocation, it's, the, it's not glamorous always, so you have to really love it and then to dedicate yourself to a PhD program and beyond is a certain type of commitment. And so for me, a milestone in my career was choosing that PhD program. It might not have been the most prestigious, 
to some elites, it might not have been the most established, right, since it was brand new. But for me, um, it was joining a long lineage of community leaders, of artists, of mothers, of fathers, of siblings who put their bodies on the line starting in the 60s, um, wrote El Plan de Santa Barbara in 1969 at UC Santa Barbara to envision what they wanted a department to look like. And so choosing that um, PhD program was very significant because it changed the total trajectory of how I think about the academy now. Um, and then another large milestone was coming back to do work in Minnesota. Uh, when I was in California for grad school, a lot of my students, undergrads, would joke, there's Chicanas in Minnesota. They even made me an award, the only Chicana in the Midwest, <laughs> one, one year. and. You know, we joke and laugh about it, but really at the heart of what they're getting at is since, you know, 1978, when Gilbert Gardenas first wrote in Atlan, like, we need to study Chicanos in the Midwest, there has been this continued void. And when scholars try to do work in the Midwest around Latinidad, they oftentimes are trying to say, like, hey, we exist, we're still here. And so being able to come back to Minnesota and extend that scholarship that's already been done for decades to think through Latinidad in the Twin Cities today has been really important um, because it really brings together the partnerships I've had as an artist f growing up here for a very long time, as well as my more recent interest as an academic in thinking through the research questions that I have um, in an ethnic studies setting. I'm currently working on a project that looks at 11 Latina artists in St. Paul and Minneapolis here in Minnesota. And it's very exciting for me because I've been working on this project for, by the time it's published, over a decade of work, but it's just evolved into uh, a much larger perspective of the Twin Cities, talking about issues that are really relevant to us today. So the artists I study are poets, hip hop musicians, performance artists, muralists, sculptors, but all of them also are community activists in their own ways. And so the book addresses issues around Black Lives Matter, gentrification, environmental justice movement, particularly trying to end the Enbridge's Line 3 pipeline. And what I love so much about this project are many things, but one of the best things about this project has been getting to learn about the mujeres, about the women who have really dedicated their lives to their craft as well as to their activism. And I think it's such a privilege as academics that we get to hold these stories in these interviews and be the vehicle for then which they get disseminated in a different way. And so that's a project that I've been working on for a while, but now has really kind of gained some momentum and I'm excited to see where it will go because I think it will impact not only policy in the Twin Cities, but I think it will also impact um, the lives of many Latinas who don't see themselves represented in art or government or other types of um, institutions. As a Chicana feminist scholar and somebody that's in Chicano and Latino studies, what is central to our discipline in our field is our deep commitment and partnership with our community. And so when we do research projects, some people in other disciplines might call it grounded theory, but essentially what we understand is that knowledge is not something that exists outside in the cloud or knowledge isn't something that we only generate in the university. Knowledge is generated everywhere, which means that it's also generated in our communities. It's generated by folks that are cooking in the back of restaurants and it's generated by folks that are picking food in the field. They are producers of knowledge. And so when I think about my research design, it's very much guided by the community that I choose to focus on. For example, as an artist from Minnesota, I'm invested in learning about other Latina artists in Minnesota, but how that project takes shape is really guided by the women themselves that I study. So we don't come in with imposed theoretical frameworks um, or imposed 
ideas or hypothesis of where a study will end, we essentially look at what I theorize as like these little movidas, these little movements that the women take and as part of my ethnographic work um, and following them, that's what generates the research questions. That's what generates the theoretical frameworks. And so for example, when I was starting off doing this project, I never thought that I would look at environmental justice. I never thought that I would look at Enbridge's Line 3 pipeline. But some of the artists that I study became very active in these movements and used their art as a way to organize, as a way to fundraise, as a way to educate people about these issues impacting our state. The pipeline goes through northern Minnesota that goes through one-fifth of the world's fresh water. So as part of my research design for this project, I felt a deep responsibility to travel and follow and learn what these women were talking about. And now that is part of the project as well. The same thing with issues around gentrification. As an individual spending most of my time in South Minneapolis living there, I experienced gentrification, but it wasn't part of my research design until I started seeing the impact that gentrification was having on the artists I study. For example, one of the artists does this amazing work where she grows corn in partnership with indigenous people from the south as well as indigenous people of the north because we know prior to colonization we had pathways across the americas where we traveled and corn is such a sacred part of our culture elote so she cultivates this corn in these community gardens takes the corn breaks it down makes paper out of it and from the paper makes these gorgeous sculptures well, what was happening was that the community garden where she had been growing for many years was going to be sold and turned into different housing. And so here's an example where again, I wasn't necessarily looking to investigate gentrification in the changing urban landscape, but because it was impacting the artists that I study, impacting her craft very like in the material reality, right? She could no longer grow corn for her sculptures in that garden. I started then focusing and then seeing how this was impacting other Latina artists in the study. And so that's what I mean by our work is driven by the community and then therefore we are also responsible to the community in the work that we produce. And I think that that's something very important that we do in Chicano Latino studies that I do as a Chicana scholar that isn't necessarily replicated in other disciplines. People might do community engagement work, but that might be something that's newer to their field or newer to the way that they look at themselves as a scholar, as opposed to the work that we do that is central to what we do. Originally, I started looking only at poets and there was this group, Palabristas, who um, they are considered to be the first um, Latina, Latino, Latinx spoken word collective in the state. And they were started in the early 2000s. And after I started working with some of these women, I started again following patterns and seeing where else they were performing, who were they were interacting with. One of the beautiful things about our Latinx community in the Twin Cities is that while we might be small in comparison to other major metropolises, we work collectively in a lot of different ways through different art mediums. So for example, a festival for Day of the Dead, for example, Festival de las Calaveras, which Deborah Ramos puts on, has these poets there. And she also has hip hop musicians and singers and other people that are part of the book project now. So the way that we were able to be in partnership was through following these initial poets and also then my own experience as an artist. You know, you see the same Latina printmaker, the same Latina muralist over and over again, really draws your attention um, and says, okay, what can we do? How can we collaborate with this person and bring them into the project? Um, and it ultimately, you know, it's that person's decision. That's what I mean when I say that I'm committed to the community. Some scholars, regardless of permission, will study an artist or study a poet. But I believe very strongly that I don't write about artists, I don't write about poets, singers, musicians, unless I have their permission. Which means that sometimes my research agenda has to shift. I might be really into something and someone doesn't want to be written about, and I respect that. Which, um, 
is not a popular way of doing research, but that's the way that I do research. You know, what we talk about in our field is kind of this negotiating this insider-outsider identity, and that's something that I continuously do in my research. Because sometimes I work alongside the women in my book project, but not as a researcher, as an artist. And other times I'm a researcher. And so for me, what's really important is the ethics around research and understanding when you're invited into somebody's home for their grandson's three-year-old birthday, which has been the case for me in my work, that's not an ethnographic research opportunity, right? That's a deep relationship in community. Now, when we sit down for a formal interview and they're aware that we're doing research, that's the research opportunity. Um, and so it's really kind of perhaps some people might say blurring lines, you can't be objective, but in Chicano Latino studies, we don't believe in objectivity. We are deeply invested in subjectivity because we believe that objectivity is the form of a colonial logic that has gotten us where we are today. My art is part of my research. It's an important strand of my research agenda because I think that creative expression really is probably the most accessible way for the public to understand radical imagination. And so my art has really ebbed and flowed over the years. I started off as a spoken word artist. You know, uh, Desdemona got me on the stage in 2009 for the first B Girl B, um, performed at First Ave when I legally wasn't allowed to and had to get, you know, snuck in the back room kind of thing. So that's my roots in the Twin Cities as a spoken word artist. And then it evolved, went to grad school, studied so much poetry. I was like, I can't write poetry anymore myself. Um, and actually started doing screen printing on a whim. I was chosen with other folks in the South Minneapolis neighborhood by Pillsbury House Theater to create art for our block in this program called Art Blocks, which is really fun. You get to know your neighbors, which could be probably the most terrifying thing sometimes, right? Knocking on your next day neighbor's door. Here we theorize about community relationships and I don't know the person that lives across the street. So that was a great opportunity in this Art Blocks program. And they said, do anything you want. And in LA, there are tons of mobile screen printing uh, carts and people you know, do this all the time. It's very popular. And in Chicano studies history, screen printing has been a really important medium, especially in the movement. Um, Self-help graphics, for example, is a fantastic space in LA that has been around for over 40 years doing screen printing, both at a very like high sophisticated level with established artists to little kids learning for the first time. So when I had an opportunity to make a cart through this program to create art for my block, it just kind of took off. And so I never was formally trained as a visual artist. I come from actually a long line of artists though in my family, which I learned in doing this. So uh, we're not 100% sure, but it, it's pretty safe to say that my great uncle Ramon was one of the first uh, gay Chicano printmakers in LA screen printmakers that was really started to flourish. So I have some of his prints and I started realizing, oh, I've seen that image my whole life. I didn't know it was a screen print, right? A silk screen. And so learning more about my own family history around art making and just trial and error failure, you know, no formal visual training at all. But I really love what I do because again, it goes back to having those deep connections with community. Um, and so a lot of the work I'm doing around visual art right now is through arts engagement, uh, getting hired by different cities, for example, Bloomington or Minneapolis, when they're interested in doing policy work and trying to engage people, having some type of art be a way to attract people to come take a boring survey, for example. Um, and so I really see my art as something that is always in relationship with people. Even the performance work I do as a performance artist, trying to interrupt spaces um, are always interactive and try to bring community to be part of it. It might seem like my art is scattered in a way, but I think that it again goes back to being an interdisciplinary scholar. I'm interested in a lot of different mediums and a lot of different materials and a lot of different manifestations of that because I think that we are really complex humans and I like to play in the messiness of our life.
La Luchadora is can translates to the fighter. Um, I'm really obsessed with the Mexican wrestlers. I love the masks. My students always giggle when they come in because I have a line of the masks in my office above my bookshelves. Um, and I, again, like to just interrupt and play with space. So one time I was on a board for MULCS, which is Mujeres Activas en Letras y Cambio Social. It's the Chicana Latina Studies formal academic organization. And I was the secretary and, you know, those kind of board meetings can get boring. So I would throw on a Mexican wrestler mask, the Santo silver one, and they would laugh at me. And, you know, but I just try to bring humor and life to the work that we do because sometimes it can be so serious. And what we do is serious, right? We're talking about concentration camps on the border. We're talking about, um, you know, women not having their reproductive rights. So the work can get very heavy. And I'm interested then how do we couple that with things that can be playful because we have a lot of joy also in our life. And so La Luchadora came out of the inspiration to bring more joy to our communities. And it was kind of a riff off of two things, the Mexican wrestler motif paired with the paleta cart, which is the popsicle cart that you would see maybe somebody pushing around and trying to sell popsicles in the neighborhood. And so I framed the original cart very large to do that. Um, since then, I've made a smaller cart because the big paleta cart was just really taxing. But it's been so fun to go to different parts of the state and see different communities from rural America, um, you know, rural Minnesota to here in the Twin Cities, just getting used to making art with this luchadora cart. I'm usually hired by an organization or a community and they have a purpose in mind. So for example, they might want to think about how are they going to use urban space differently. I was hired by the city of Bloomington to think about what they're calling the South Loop and I printed in a fire station which was really cool because I had the firefighters help me lift my cart out and got to, you know, see all the things that they have in a fire station. But the design for that was to think about the area of what they're calling the South Loop, which is by Mall of America. And so they come up with an idea. And then what I do as an artist is I research the space, I research the community, and then I also put my own flair to it. So, for example, one of the things around the South Loop is this beautiful wildlife, natural uh, habitat. And so I made sure to incorporate the birds of that area. But then I also, as a scholar that studies gentrification, want to remind people that we can call whatever we want a place, South Loop, North Loop, we can rebrand, which is a part of gentrification. But at the end of the day, we're on Dakota land. And so as part of that design, I put underneath Dakota land always, because it's important that we not forget the first peoples of Turtle Island, the people who we asked in relationship to be on this land with, and that they're very much still alive and doing work that matters, right? They're not something that's relegated to the past. And so that's an example of how I like to be in partnership with an organization that they have their own vision of an image or a design or some type of art production they want to see paired with then my own politics because I think it's a great opportunity to also educate folks that might not have thought about, for example, the South Loop in that way. I don't think that my work is unique. I think as academics, we're told that we need to have work that's unique, but I think I actually come from a very long legacy of Chicana, Black, feminist scholars, um, indigenous scholars, native women who have been doing this work and have been asking these questions. What's unique about my work is I'm looking at a particular time period with this particular group of people, but I really like to consider my project as an extension to this long legacy of work that I'm doing. I'm creating a theory based on the women in this project um, that's grounded in their forms of knowledge production that helps us look at different ways that ethnic communities in the umbrella of Latina are able to exist without being flattened. And so that's this term that I'm come up with called interlatina subjectivity, 
And essentially it's tracing how Latina artists in the Twin Cities are able to hold true to their ethnic identity while building networks of solidarity with other Latinas who might have different ethnic identities from their own. This is useful because when we're looking at social movements, regardless of race or ethnicity, we want to understand how people form relationship and how people form these networks. And so my argument is that these Latinas, through inter-Latina subjectivity, are providing a blueprint for how that can happen. But this isn't necessarily research that no one else has done before. I'm just answering a small question that is particular to this time and space. One thing that I would like people to understand about my work is that there is beauty in contradiction and there's beauty in ambiguity. My work really relishes the ambiguity and contradiction of life. So I don't have necessarily one theoretical framework for everything that I do. I don't have one answer that we're striving for. Sometimes I theorize the life of these women, for example, in my book project, and in the next chapter, it completely contradicts itself because that's how we are as humans. We're very complex beings. As a Chicana feminist scholar, we talk a lot about subjectivity and how subjectivity through an intersectional lens is very messy, right? We're not just looking at race. We're not just looking at how something's gendered. We're accounting for all these things, including language, geography, nationhood. And so because of these multiple identities, because of these intersecting identities, when we do our research and study, for example, a Latina artist, we understand her and her complete wholeness, which could be very contradictory, which has a lot of ambiguity. But rather than create this very prescript, nice, clean theoretical frameworks, theoretical outcomes saying, all Latina artists do this, or what we can see in the Twin Cities is X, we say instead, it's all these things together, which can be very messy. And some people looking at it might say, well, you never came to a conclusion. But actually we did. It's in that process of getting there that is the conclusion itself, which can be kind of jarring for some people, particularly if they're not familiar with ethnic studies work or they're not familiar looking through an intersectional lens. They want a clean answer. They want one plus one is two. And that's not the work that I do. Instead, I say, what if we took two and turned it upside down? And what do we see instead? What else could be? And in case of like my current book project, I'll come to some conclusions, right? There will definitely be policy implications. For example, one way to stop cultural displacement is to stop housing displacement. So if we want to support artists who are working class an original to the communities where we're seeing gentrification. I'm not talking about outside transplant artists, I'm talking about people from within the community. We need to have rent control. We need to have housing policy that's affordable, that's safe. And then that will also um, limit cultural displacement. So of course we come to conclusions in the research, but we also don't have such definitive answers that it doesn't leave room for other possibilities. The other thing I think that's important that I want people to know about my work is that there's a lot at stake here. We're talking about people potentially being displaced from their neighborhoods. We're talking about people being racially profiled, about people losing land, about people experiencing multiple levels of violence. And so even if I'm talking about a poem, for example, or looking at a mural, and we might say, oh, that's aesthetically pleasing and investigated on an artistic level, we're also knowing that there's a deep love as well as a deep level of violence that people are trying to subvert as artists in creating these productions. So for example, one of the artists I study is putting a mural on El Colegio High School right now in South Minneapolis. And it's beautiful. It has the community out, everyone's masked up. 
but the reason why that mural also is so important is because it's representing Afro-Latinx folks that have been oftentimes erased from our history, that have been violently persecuted by the United States government. And so to look at that mural, there are many layers to it. And I really want folks to understand that my research, yes, is about art, but it's also about the deep ways that people are trying to transform the communities in which they live. I love teaching. I think it's such a privilege that we have to be in the classroom, even when we're in large research universities like the University of Minnesota, which is fantastic because we have so many resources and it really helps drive our research. I think though that for myself in Chicano Latino studies, I have the privilege to work with a lot of working class students, first generation college students, students who might be international students or have migrated to the U.S. at certain times in their life. And I learn so much from my students. I really think of the classroom as a collaborative learning opportunity. And so I try to invest a lot of time into building community within the classroom, which again goes back to my research and my investment in building deep relationships. I think at the end of the day, whether we're talking about my teaching, my research, or my service, I'm a community organizer at heart. And so I think that as long as we can show up for each other and we can believe in each other, we're gonna have a really positive research outcome, learning outcome, service outcome. And so that's the kind of atmosphere I try to create in my classroom. I think that part of what our job is as educators, as scholars, as uh, teachers in the classroom is to tap into some small connection with our students in a very human level. And I think in doing that, that brings people to the table that otherwise would say, no, this is not for me. And I have to do that constantly as an ethnic studies professor because when I look out into my lecture hall, most of those people are there because they have to have the requirement for graduation. They're not there because they want to. There are some students that of course are, that then become majors and minors, but ultimately I teach oftentimes students that have never heard of Chicano before they signed up, let alone what it, the term is. And so I really try to reach one-on-one -on -one with students at a human level, getting to know their name, which doesn't seem like a big deal, but when you're at an institution like the University of Minnesota, it's huge. Um, students have told me I'm sometimes the only professor they have that knows their name. And I do this even if I have 100 plus students in a classroom. Um, also trying to learn a fun fact about them. I joke, I might not know your name, but I'll know something random about like, you're allergic to mangoes, which two students were last semester, which is weird. Uh, but the idea again is being able to find humanity in every single person unfortunately because of where we are in the world today is a very subversive act because so much of what we see in our government or in different forms of media is to dehumanize each other is to not see migrants as people so that we can put children in cages to not see black people as fully human and so women can be like brianna taylor in her bed at night and be murdered by police and we don't see the outrage in that. And so for me, building a sense of community with students is to see them in their truest human sense. And hopefully that's the way that we start building those bridges with people despite our radical differences we might hold. From my classes, I hope that my students get a few things. The first is that I hope they are inspired to do work that matters, to transform whatever part of their world they consider to be their community. Whether it's at family dinner where they've learned new ideas from Chicano Latino studies that challenge the way that they were brought up or affirm the way they were brought up, but that they feel confident enough that they can have conversations with their families, they can have conversations with their neighbors and their broader community. Because at the end of the day, I really believe we create change on a micro level. It's in those interpersonal connections where we have an opportunity to grow in terms of how we think about 
gender identity or political affiliation. And so that's the first thing that I hope that they get is the confidence to have those challenging conversations. The second thing that I hope that they get from my classroom is that they understand themselves better in the world in a global way. So Gloria Zaldúa has a phrase, um, inner works, public acts, meaning if we work on ourselves internally, and that can look you know, very different to many different types of people. For some, they might be drawn to spirituality. For some, they might be drawn to physical endurance. Some might be drawn to mental therapy, whatever kind of inner work it means, but it's really about deep self-reflection. Uh, when you do that, then you can go do public acts. You can go out into the community in which you are part of and create change. And so what I hope for my students in my classroom is that they understand that those are in relationship to each other. And we try to do exercises, even if we're talking, you know, a large lecture, intro to Latino studies course, we want them to understand how does this material impact who you are as an individual and how is your identity, your understanding of self as an individual influencing how you are immersed in this work. And I think if we all had a better understanding of ourselves and then had an ability to reflect on that in relationship to others, we would be a lot further along as a culture. And then the third and final thing that I want students to get from the work that I do in the classroom is to have a real understanding of how to think critically. And I know a lot of education people always say this. So I want our students to think critically, right? It's kind of your go-to answer. But in an ethnic studies department, asking questions, whether we're talking about historical injustice to contemporary social movements that are occurring, but asking the hard questions are how we're able to create change. And asking questions, being able to think critically in that way is a skill. It doesn't come easily to most people. It has to be cultivated. And how do you grow that skill? By teaching students how to have different forms of analysis to many different types of subjects, to having students practice their written communication, their oral communication. A lot of skills are, that are at the heart of a liberal arts education, we try to do in the classroom. But we do it in such a way where they're constantly thinking about issues related to power and being able to interrogate power, investigate power, and also organize to build power. I have always loved education. When I was little in first grade, I would go home and my little sister would be there, not in preschool yet, because she was much younger, and I would flip over a laundry basket and try to teach her everything I learned. And so I felt very strongly from a young age that I wanted to be a teacher. Um, in my graduate program in Chicana Chicano Studies, we always joke that every good Chicana either wanted to be an immigrant rights lawyer or a teacher. So I met the teacher box. And when I was an undergrad, I got a major in education and English, and I got licensed in the state of Minnesota to teach uh, fifth through 12th grade communication arts literature. I had the opportunity to work in a St. Paul public school and do my student teaching in high school. And I loved those students. They were fantastic. But I also knew I could not teach in a high school every day. I have such deep respect for people that do that work because I saw immediately, even as a student teacher, the limitations of our K-12 system and how they really stifle creativity and they stifle any way thinking outside the box. And as an artist and knowing who I am as a person, I, I just knew that that would be a very challenging environment for me. And I had no idea you could become an academic. I should have, right? I was an undergrad and I had professors, but I never thought that that could be my trajectory. I never thought that I could have that career. And it was only upon graduating um, from undergrad where some of my professors said, like, why don't you go to grad school? And so even though I graduated very high in my class, summa cum laude, all those you know accolades, I was working at a bar and studying for the GRE during my you know, bar close with the book there, uh, I never had any of those fancy programs to go into. It was really just me thinking, 
This would be so awesome to be able to read and write for the rest of my life and get paid doing it. Like that's what I do in my free time. I didn't know it was a career. And so when I really got deep into it, I remember getting accepted into my graduate program and I learned that you couldn't just pick where you wanted to work. My dream job was always working at the University of Minnesota in Chicano Latino studies. And I thought I could just go back home and get a job. And I realized that there's all these complex things like FTE, and tenure track lines and my heart sank because I wanted to be a professor in my home state and so a lot of events circulated um, and I guess the universe has a way of working things out but I was able to come back here as a professor in Chicano Latino studies and so I really feel strongly that I have my dream job and I really stand behind the fact that I think the colleagues I have in ethnic studies are doing such cutting and re edge research that really will transform our society because we do the work that's not glamorous. We do the work of transforming people that come in with racist ideologies and then making them understand historical trauma and historical injustice, and then they become better medical doctors. But we don't have that necessarily be tracked that's not necessarily tracked when we're looking at the university and how many majors and minors we have and what i always tell my students is there's no linear path i didn't necessarily know for sure that this is where i would end up even if i desired it but it's trusting yourself and trusting the mentors that you have mentorship has been always critical in my life without my mentors i would not be here today and so I really feel strongly that that's my responsibility to my students too, to further that mentorship and make sure that they can follow their own path and one day have their dream job. Lately, what's keeping me up at night is I'm the chair of Academia Cesar Chavez Board of Directors, which is a partnership that we have with the Department of Chicano Latino Studies and this charter school, which is on the east side in St. Paul. It was co-founded by community, but definitely founded by Ramona Rosales, who, interestingly enough, in 1968 was a student at the University of Minnesota and protested with other folks in this group called Latin Liberation Front at Morrill Hall. And because of their work, the Department of Chicano Studies was established in 1971, the first classes in 1972, making it the very first and still today only Chicano Studies Department in the Midwest. There are programs, but not departments. Fast forward many years, Ramona um, and other community members work very hard. She's the founder of this charter school. And why it keeps me up at night right now is I'm thinking about our families in the Latinx community, many of whom might be immigrant or first generation here who work multiple jobs and are having a really hard time making sure that their students receive the education that they deserve in distance learning. And so I'm not sure if this will become a future research project, but it's definitely something that I put a lot of advocacy work into because I want to make sure that Latinx students in Minnesota, particularly at the young grades looking pre-K through eighth grade, have the resources that they need so that we can close the opportunity gap. Just in 2014, Latinx students had the lowest graduation rate in high school of um, in Minnesota, and that was the lowest in the entire nation. And how this impacts me as a college professor is when we look at the whole K-12 pipeline, I want to make sure that Latinx students are able to be in the class at the college level. And But it starts young. It starts at pre-K, right? And so I'm up feeding my daughter in the middle of the night, thinking about how do we make sure we can get Chromebooks to students? How do we work with the state of Minnesota so that they can create alternative educational assessments because we know that standardized tests do not capture the knowledge of our students necessarily because of language barriers, for example. And so I don't necessarily have any solutions, but I'm trying to build relationships with people that do or can think creatively about how we overcome these challenges.
in our discipline as Chicano and Latino studies scholars, we are committed to social justice, and that can be understood or interpreted by scholars in a very broad way. So some people might be making historical interventions, some people might be looking at contemporary work. For myself as a Chicana feminist scholar, I'm deeply invested in thinking about how do we critique our current systems that definitely have levels of injustice, whether we're talking about the interpersonal or the systemic, but that my scholarship should always do a few things. The first, it should be honest in what's happening. And um, the second is that it should provide a level of hope for a direction in which we can see the world becoming a better place. And that might sound really corny, <laughs> you know, but when we're thinking about scholarship, we don't have the luxury as ethnic studies scholars, as folks that look at black, indigenous, people of color communities to necessarily create scholarship for scholarship's sake. We have a responsibility to make sure that the scholarship that we produce creates outcomes for systemic change. That's what I believe as a Chicana feminist scholar, and that's what I try to do in all of the work that I produce.